Well, thank you. God bless you. Uh, just let's echo those words that Andy gave us as uh, he shared Rose's death with us. He said, I press on to reach the goal, to win the prize to which God has called us, all of us, heavenwards in Christ Jesus. That's a wonderful, um, a wonderful conclusion and a wonderful uh, encouragement to move on, isn't it? So um, I'm praying that what we have this morning is we've got a wonderful passage before us this morning, that it will be an encouragement to you. It will be a strength to you. And uh, I just want to pray, Heavenly Father, come by your spirit now, anoint your word, anoint our ears to hear it. May we be receptive, genuinely receptive, genuinely open, that we can receive everything that you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Okay, so it's a wonderful, uh, uh, a wonderful passage we have, and uh, Jesus walking on the water, possibly the greatest, possibly the best known of, of the miracles, um, the fifth sign that uh, John highlights from Jesus, the uh, mention is made in all the Gospels except Luke, who missed out a big chunk of quite a lot of material, don't, don't blame him for that, but um, it's, it's a, a story that everybody knows, almost everybody knows that Jesus walked on the water, even non-Christians know about this, don't they, and they ridicule us for it. And they even ridicule him because, well, it just doesn't happen, does it? Dense material sinks, so they say. In the scheme of values that is present in the world today, the worldview is that the supernatural doesn't happen. And... I remember as a young Christian, and that is going back a bit, about 52 years, I was 21, um, when I first came to the Lord and I looked at this miracle, I thought, okay, so there was a sandbank or something. It looked like he was walking on the water, but actually it was a sandbank. And similarly with that, the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 that Andy shared with us, Oh, well, it was a spirit of generosity that rose up among people and they all shared their picnics. That was because I brought with me into Christianity my Western worldview that most of you are familiar with. I followed the materialistic mindset of secular humanism, which is opposed to Christianity and all things religious. And basically, it could be summed up with um, something like this. Supernatural stuff is spooky nonsense. Um, reality is what I can see and hear and measure. Remember Andy's friend who said to him, you're asking me to suspend my disbelief. And the reply was, no, I'm asking you to expand your belief. And that's what this passage is asking us to do. Folks, we've got to make way for the supernatural in our lives, in our speaking, in our thinking and in our action. And that's the challenge of this passage. You see, the materialistic mindset, the Western worldview says, uh, are there not natural laws that are um, unchangeable? Are there not immutable laws of physics and astronomy that just don't change? Dense things sink. People don't walk on the water. Yeah. But didn't God speak the universe into being? Didn't God bring all the laws into operation that we have subsequently described what he has already established? And then 
didn't the great I am turn water into wine, as we've heard about recently? Didn't the great I am heal the official's servant? Didn't he feed the 5,000 and the other 35 miracles that Andy mentioned that are well attested? Nobody denied them at the time. Can we understand it? No, that's not the point. Why should we be able to understand the workings of almighty God, our creator? We're the clay, he's the potter. The question isn't, should we understand it? Which is what Western materialism says. If they can't understand it, it doesn't exist. The question is, do we believe it? Cannot this great I am suspend the laws of gravity, the laws of physics that he has made? Can he not accelerate the healing that he has put in place, the principles that he's established? You see, if we can be a Christian without believing in the supernatural, we don't need Jesus. We don't need him, certainly don't need him to have been raised from the dead. But as that song that Mike put up this morning said, he's still rolling away the stone. And Paul says, um, if Christ has not been raised, this is in 1 Corinthians I can't remember, 15, I think. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. And then later on, he says, if only for this life, if only for this life we have put our trust in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Folks, the supernatural is an essential part of our faith. And the challenge is, can we believe it you're still rolling stones jesus you're still alive and we are alive in you so that's just a little uh, background to the passage so let's go to uh, john 6 and verse 16 when evening came his disciples went down to the lake Remember, uh, Jesus had gone up onto a mountain after feeding the 5,000 plus. Um, they'd gone down to the lake. They got into a boat. They set off across the lake for Capernaum, going back home. But now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. That wouldn't have frightened experienced fishermen. And when they'd rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water. And they were frightened. They were frightened because they saw something beyond the natural. But he said to them, listen to this. He said, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat. And actually, another gospel says, and they worshipped him because they recognized that he was saying, I am God. He used the great unspeakable name of God. He said, Ego Amy. And immediately, the boat reached the shore where they were heading. Let's just go straight to that. Um, I hardly need to refer to the next bit because it's basically the crowd chasing chasing after them and uh, finding that uh, uh, only one boat had left the shore and then they realized neither Jesus nor his disciples were there. So they, they raced back to Capernaum because they wanted to see more of the miracles. So ego Amy was what Jesus said. Translated, really hard to translate actually. Um, ego I, Amy, I am. He was really saying, I am who I am. Uh, it's a continuous state that he was expressing, a state that 
that began before creation, that continued right throughout all history and still is existing now. That's what God is. That's who God is. And Jesus was saying, I am that God. The unsayable name. It's so holy that the Jews couldn't pronounce it when it was in Hebrew. And so that takes us right back. Here's a hyperlink. <laughs> it takes us right back to that passage in Exodus. Let's go back to that. In Exodus chapter 3 and verse 11, where Moses had been asked by God, you are the one that's going to lead the people out of slavery in Egypt. Do you see the parallel? Jesus rescued the disciples in the boat on the way to Capernaum uh, as, a, as a kind of a type of Moses. Um, Moses was the one to bring the people out of captivity in Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? I, why me? And God said, here's the comfort. I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And Moses said to God, still didn't want to do it. Suppose, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you and they asked me what is his name because that was a key question so what is he really like what are his qualities then what shall I tell them God said to Moses ego eimi only in God's language Hebrew <laughs> God said to Moses I am who I am that is what you're to say to the Israelites I am has sent me to you God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. Wow. Folks, it was I am who called the people out of Egypt. And it was I am who brought them safely through the storm to Capernaum. And it was I am who was born in the stable in Bethlehem. And it was I am who died on a cross in Calvary. It could hardly be clearer. 24 times in John, that statement is made. Ego. Amy. Remember when Jesus was debating with the Pharisees in, in John chapter 8, verse 58, and they were saying, you know, we're descendants of Abraham. And Jesus's reply was, because they had said, who do you think you are? Recognize that question. Who do you think you are? What's your authority? Who are you? And very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered. Before Abraham was born, I am. Ego, Amy. And then um, in the Garden of Gethsemane, John chapter 18, verse 4, at his arrest, remember, crowd came to arrest him. They didn't know quite who he was. Judas had kissed him. Um, and Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. Ego Amy, probably in Aramaic. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas, the traitor, was standing there with them. I am he. You can let the rest of them go. Remember when um, Philip is puzzled about all of this? Um, Show us the father, he said. Um, and, uh, you know, Jesus said, with, with some amazement. Um, but Philip, you've been, I've been with you all this time. Do you not know that if you've seen the, me, you've seen the Father? If you've seen the Father, you've seen me. I am in the Father and the Father is in me. It's the same message. And then we have been singing, haven't we? Uh, and 
singing the opening lines of John's gospel. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And the word was God. He, Jesus, was the word, was with God in the beginning and always has been and always will be. No time to go into the intricacies of the, the um, Trinity at this point, but I think you can see the point. In fact, Paul says to the Philippians, your attitude should be the same as that was in Christ Jesus, who was in very nature God. And later in John 8, verse 24, I think we've got that somewhere. He goes even further. If you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be, you would die in your sin. I told you, you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. Folk, it's really, really important to understand and believe this. Thomas struggled, didn't he? Thomas couldn't quite accept the supernatural fact that Jesus had raised been raised from the dead and said because he hadn't actually seen Jesus said unless I see the holes in his hands unless I put my hand in his side where the where the spear was I I, I, I just can't believe it and then a week later Jesus appeared again to the disciples called Thomas to him said here put your put your finger in my holes in my hand and and, and touch Thomas didn't need to do that. He fell at his feet and worshipped him because he recognized that he was God. He said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus' response was, you believe because you've seen. But this is encouraging to us. But blessed are those who believe and yet who have not seen. There's a, a very interesting addition to this story of the walking on the water in Matthew's gospel that isn't mentioned by John. I'd like us to turn to that now. Um, probably John had his reasons for not including it. Um, it's the part that concerns Peter. Um, it didn't really it wasn't part of John's purpose to um, elevate or, or even mention Peter at this point, but he was in the boat as well. And of course, Matthew was in the boat. And this is what happened according to Matthew. Um, same, same situation. Um, they see Jesus. They think it's a ghost. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, ego Amy, don't be afraid. And Peter replied, Typical Peter, um, always uh, quick to jump in, literally and metaphorically. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, not quite sure. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Big step, bold statement. Come, Jesus said. And then Peter, just imagine this storm boat fairly large got down out of the boat i want you to imagine this moment walked on the water the first step is supernatural and came towards jesus but when he saw the wind when he saw the natural elements he was afraid and beginning to sink cried out lord save me god will always save us when we step out in faith in him, in response to his call. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him. You only worship God. Only God is worthy of worship, saying, truly, you are the son of God. This is walking by faith, not by sight. And I think, it's probably, I think it's probably quite important at this point 
to say, you know, this is this is a step that we are all called to make. Um, Mike mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago about Blondin. You remember who Blondin was? 1859. He was a French tightrope walker, and he walked many times across Niagara Falls. Some of you may have been to Niagara Falls. It's terrifying just to stand and look at it, never mind walk across it on a tightrope. But Blondin did that several times. He even fried an egg in the middle of the tightrope crossing. He even wheeled a wheelbarrow across, forwards and backwards. And then on one occasion, huge crowd assembled on the bank. He said, do you believe that I could wheel a man across in this wheelbarrow? And everybody said, yes. I believe that. And then he said, who is the first volunteer? And there was silence. Eventually, one man did step forward. Some say it was the Duke of Newcastle. One man stepped forward out of the great multitude and was wheeled across Niagara Falls. I wouldn't have done that. So um, that's the difference, isn't it? Uh, we all say we believe, but that step to hop in the wheelbarrow, that's putting it into practice when Jesus says, come. It's such an exciting way to live, to walk by faith. And that's one of the messages of this passage. So how do we work this out in practice in our little lives? Um, well, every time we say something that we can't say, every time we do something or attempt something that we can't do, we're walking on the water. It might be in a meeting. It might be uh, things that have happened today and other Sundays where um, words of prophecy have been spoken where we've spoken out something that we don't really know. Sometimes it can happen in life. It's better if it does happen in ordinary life. And you will have had some examples of it. I remember one time when I was working in a school, not, a, not this school, but uh, I'd been praying for the head of RE in this school. And I was just looking at him in the staff room. And I felt God say to me, I want you to say to this man, Son, I want you back. Now, that was that was my moment. Am I going to walk on the water here? Because I didn't know anything much about his background. I didn't know how he'd receive it. He might not like me for it. I might think it's what's it to do with you. But I prayed, Jesus, are you saying come? And I felt he was. So I got down out of the boat. You understand me? I went across to him. I said, Mike, he was called. I said, uh, I don't know if you actually believe that God can speak to us. He's muttered something. And I said, well, I just feel God is saying to you. And I felt quite trembly about it. Son, I want you back. As Eyes filled up with tears, and I don't know what happened next, but I did what I had to do. Do you understand what I mean? That that's walking on the water. That's supernatural. And that can happen a lot more than it does, both in meetings and in the world. And when we do things or we attempt to do things that we can't do, we've stepped into the miracle zone. We've trusted God. We're walking on the water. You know, when I was 40, I think I was, and we, we were called to start the church, we couldn't do it. We couldn't do it. But Jesus was saying, come. I was running an English department full time. Katie was working full time. We had little kids. But... Jesus held us up. Do you understand what I mean? We walked on the water. We attempted something we couldn't do in the natural. And uh, you're, you're, the, you're the fruit of this. Hallelujah. So it can be things like that. It can be every time you give money 
that you can't really afford because Jesus has said, come. Every time you um, uh, give time that you haven't really got because you're in a rush and you're listening to God and he's saying, come and you obey. You're stepping out of the boat. You're walking on the water. John Ort Ortberg has written a quite a famous book about all of this. And the title is, if you want to walk on the water, you've got to get out the boat. It's going to be uncomfortable. You've got to come out of your comfort zone. So every time we, we pray for healing, we can't heal anyone. But when we pray for healing, we're stepping out of the boat and walking on the water. Only God can respond to that. Every time we pray for an infilling of the Holy Spirit and how wonderful it was last Monday when remotely on Zoom, if you please, um, Mike prayed for each one of the, the guests on the Alpha Course. Some of you are here at the moment. And most, if not all of you, received some tangible experience. In one case, it was a fragrance. In another case, it was a warm glow. Um, all sorts of other experiences that um, we could not have generated. There was no hype. It's walking on the water. It's what we're called to do. And it was wonderful. And it's precious. And the question has to be, Lord, if it's you, tell me. As Peter said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. This is why, and Mike's been saying this to us a lot recently, this is why we have to listen carefully to God. Even now, I'm trying to listen carefully to God because he doesn't always say come. I, I met a chap in the gym just last week and we, we talked sometimes and um, he just came across to me on this occasion and said, you know, um, you're, you know your church, is it, is it meeting at the moment? And I immediately, something just clicked inside me and I started praying, God, is it you? Are you saying, come, am I meant to open up with this guy and, you know, risk it? Because it's always a risk, risk it with him and say uh, some spiritual things. And, you know, I didn't feel Jesus was saying, come. I didn't feel it was the right time. And we, I just answered his questions. And, uh, but the opening is still there. The opportunities are still there. So that's why we have to listen so carefully to see if God is saying, come. If the great I am is saying, come. So just to finish off then, ordinary us in our homes, in our when we go to the shop, when we're allowed to go to the shop, when we've got workers in our home, um, are we listening for the I am to say, come, walk on the water with me, step out in faith. And just a couple of examples that come to mind. I think it was Helen who put out that video of the, the lads in Brighton. You see that? Just wave at me if you, you see that. The Emmanuel Church, I think it was, yeah. Um, that was great, wasn't it? Five or six guys, just ordinary young men, look quite fashionable with it, stepped out onto the Brighton prom, I think it was, um, because God had said come, and without any instruments, just started to, what was it? Um, praise the name of the Lord our God. Praise his name. And, you know, it was powerful, wasn't it? And not only to you as Christians, I could see the joggers having a little look. I could see the walkers having a little look, you know, because when ordinary people step out of the boat and walk on the water and, and, trust, and, and trust God, move into the supernatural realm, people take notice. People take notice of you and me when we step out and we do extraordinary things because the great I am has said come so it's what we're made for 
It's what we're saved for. And the world takes notice when ordinary people like you and me walk on the water. God bless you as you trust him in these ways. Amen.